that that was just to change the mood from Runner's Requiem. <laughs> it's a stewardship. Um, the other thing is that video did for me was made me feel pretty good about myself. <laughs> because while I do do a lot, I do do a lot of online shopping. Um, Oh, come on. I, um, I'm not quite. Stewards. 
and all of those people who sort of take care of us and our belongings. Anything else? Service. Service. Yeah. Care for the earth. Sanctuary and a more usable, friendly 
building. And I'm really excited about it. But there is part of me, and I bet there's part of everyone that says, is this how we should be spending our money? Our church isn't full every Sunday. In the summer, do we even need two services? Is this how we should be spending our money? Um, and if you're talking in favor of our of our building campaign, you'd say, yes, this church will be more usable to the community. It will reach out. It will be better able to serve the community. Uh, I really hope that's true. I don't want to speak against the building campaign. I voted for it. So what do we take care of? Name things. Dogs. Children. Children. Ourselves. Ourselves. The marginalized. The marginalized. Oh. Creation. Creation. The roof. The roof. <laughs> That's an expensive undertaking too, but we have to keep a roof over our heads. The pool. That's a total waste of money. Sure, it's fun. <laughs> There's a lot of things we take care of. The Lord. I'm sorry, I missed that last. I said the pool. My pool. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to take care of a pool. <laughs> the Lord God took took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. Stewardship is a theological belief that humans are responsible for taking care of the world. It's created by a basic belief in a deity who created the heavens and the earth and all the creatures upon it. The creator then gave his human creation the task of taking care of it. In the Bible, stewardship is another way of talking about how you live your life. In the New Testament, the word steward is rooted in the Greek word oikonomos which means the manager of the household. If you are a steward in ancient, if you were a steward in ancient Greek culture, you were not the owner of the house. Instead, you have been the manager of the house and the household affairs. From making sure your home was clean to managing the finances and perhaps servants, you would have managed everything on behalf of the owner. And who is the owner? In these definitions, you'll see that your life is not your own. Your life is on loan from God. And God calls you to steward everything about your life for his glory and the good of others. So we manage, we care for, steward so much our time, our relationships, our work, whatever it is. You take care of your history, your reputation. As a part of that, you take care of your digital footprint. Our physical health, our, our mental, intellectual health, our faith, our spirituality. We take care of our community and our environment. And I'd like to talk a little bit about each of those. So as it concerns time, my hands assistant is going to hand out one of these to everybody. I think that's probably enough. I don't know what I was expecting today. My printer was acting up, so I kept hitting print. A lot of note paper coming up. So how do you spend your time? Uh, we sleep. If we are being healthy, we sleep. Uh, eight hours a day. I got. I got. Uh, there's some mistakes in there, aren't there, Ben? About. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll get that message. So don't worry about including sleep on your list here. I know it's super important and we spend, if we're healthy, we maybe spend a third of our time sleeping. And that's super important. And I'm not very good at it. So I don't steward my rest time very well. I know, I'm a night owl and then he gets up at 6.30. So. Um, so it's absolutely essential, I believe, to be intentional about how we live our days, how much activity we're willing to pack into our lives, whether we're attentive to people around us, perpetually distracted by buzzes and dings and our own monkey mind. 
And if I check Facebook just before I go to bed, all of a sudden another hour and a half has passed. And that is a stupid waste of time, in my humble opinion. And I do a lot of it. So I want you to think for a second about how you spend your time on personal things. How might we define personal things? Um, you know, taking care of your house, taking care of your kids, taking care of yourself, exercising. How much of your time do you spend doing those things? Any ideas of what we do on personal time? We eat, we prepare food, we clean our house. Go to the gym. We go to the gym. Hobbies. You're, you take your, you drive your kids until they're 16 years old everywhere. Oh, we need more? Oh, two. Okay. What else do we do in our personal time? We watch TV. We goof around on social media. We read. That's better. Garden. Feed the birds. Feed the birds. Fish. Feed the fish. Oh, we fish. <laughs> <laughs> the fish feed us. We go hiking. All those things are personal things. A huge portion of that personal time, if you have children in your home, is that. Take care of your house taking care of the kids. How much time do you spend on community issues? And what are community issues? Might be feeding the hungry. Ringing bells. Raising money for the Y. Raising money for the Y or for Summer Lutheran Church. Raising money for anybody in our community. Uh, going to the League of Women Voters Forum. Volunteering. What else are community issues? Local politics. School board. Following the school board. Going to the PTSA meetings. Uh, volunteering in your, in your school. And on global issues, we think about global issues a lot. We hear about global issues all the time. We, every time we pick up a newspaper, it is all about global issues. And I think for most of us, what we do on, with global issues is consume by reading and listening and stuff because our, we may not feel equipped, um, trained, in a position to do to do something as it concerns global issues, but um, learning about global issues is certainly how we spend time on those things. Oh, wait a minute, I missed something. Our time can be as much a treasure as our financial finances. Can the church talk about our calendars as theological documents? Not long ago, we talked. Our pastors were here talking about how this church is used during the week outside of our Sunday morning worship, music, even outside of our church activities like, uh, like this, or choir practice, or board meetings, or committee meetings. I'm trying to think of something else kids do here during the week, Cub Scouts. Um, but our church is used, one of the reasons why we are building, uh, in this building commitment is how much our church is used in the community. And I think our calendar there becomes a theological document. And what do we give our time to? Do we intentionally make time for spiritual practices or do we hope that We take care of our relationships. 
What are we doing to protect and grow the relationships we have with our family and with our friends? How do we nurture these relationships? It takes time and intention to sustain a healthy relationship. It takes two, but you can control your part. When I was growing up, um, on my report cards, it always said good leader. And um, that's important, but being a good follower is also important. But what that meant for me personally was I always had to invite kids to do stuff. And I would say to my mom, why doesn't someone else call me? Why do I always have to be the one to make the plans? And it was hard. But if you're on the other side and you're saying, why doesn't, you know, nobody's called me for a long time. Nobody likes me. Maybe if you're always the one getting called, it's time to turn the table around a little bit and call. I don't see, yeah. No, go ahead. So a really, I don't do this often enough, but I really started to drive to when someone was kind of visiting with somebody or meet somebody on the street or they say, we should get together sometime. How often does that go in, right? So what I've started trying to how about next Tuesday? Yeah. When that, when that yeah. Um, what kind of reaction do you get? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> certainly more often than just saying, let's get together. Yeah. I mean, actually, it's some sort of yeah. further interaction. And what if it doesn't? Yeah. You've yeah. extended. Yeah. 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 Right. So when someone says, let's get together, say, well, how about next Tuesday? What do you have to lose? Mike, go ahead, Jen. Um, there are a couple people in the congregation that I have coffee with every Thursday morning, uh, French Christmas and French Thanksgiving, and we call it our AA group. It's called an attitude adjustment. There you go. Know. And we do that faithful because it's just part of who you want to be and to care for each other. Yes. just say, let's get together on Thursday night. It doesn't happen. Um, and I always say to them, they do have the center of gravity, I know. But it's the same distance to travel from St. Paul to Rochester as it is from Rochester to St. Paul. I didn't know that. Because <laughs> you never do that. Yeah. Wait, is coming home faster or slower? Way faster. Because when you're going there, oh, I don't want to know. Um, I think that's, I think that um, if you have a group like that, for me, I have a sewing group. And we meet every Monday. Now, if you can't come, you can't come. Things happen. You've got a vet appointment or a kid health appointment or something. But Sewing is the least of what we do in that group. Um, there is, a, you know, two women in that group who, who have children who have really struggled with uh, substance abuse. There, there are, there is a person who recently had lost her husband to um, Alzheimer's. There is a person who has had cancer in that group. There is a person who's got a child with anxiety and depression. There, I mean, every one of us have been through some real trauma. Well, we're all my age, so, you know, who has gotten this far without having trauma in their life, but it takes work. And it takes stopping people and saying, what's going on these days? And you can't always leave it to somebody else work, 
So on that list of how you spend your time, if you're still working or if you're volunteering. If you're volunteering, I hope you're doing something important. Then think about what well, volunteer work is useless. But, um, are we doing everything we can? Are we doing everything we can to help our employers, our employees, and their goals? Work is integral to human existence, and creatures made in God's image. Our work is good and blessed when it cooperates with God's purposes for the world. God blesses us with the capacities to do good work. There are different reasons we work. We work for subsistence in order to live, in order to keep that healthy roof over our head in order to feed our children. We work to enhance our lives. It is socially valued and contributes to a person's sense of well-being, identity, and self-esteem. It is a form of service. And when we care for ourselves by living fully into our callings, we are also stewards of God's creation. Now some jobs I think are really easy to say that is God's work. Teach medicine, clerical work. I mean, clergy type of type of work. It might be a little bit harder to see your job as God's work. Um, so I spent much of my career teaching. I was good. I was a good teacher, and I think I did a good job. And I think my students had more in their head when they left than when they came. So I felt like that was good. Um, and then I spent a good part of my career working with Olympic sponsors on schmoozing their top customers by taking them to the Olympic Games. And it was a job that, that dealt with the one half of one percent probably. And I really liked that job, and I got a lot out of that job. I got to travel all over the place. But I did struggle with my role in the world, and if this is a really constructive thing to do. And now, as a sort of retired person who makes cute things, you know, uh, it's fun. It gives people a smile. Maybe that's enough. But it makes me happy. <laughs> so when you're trying it, when you define your work, is it hard for you to say you're doing God's work? Or is it important? I asked my friend uh, who talked about living a Christ-like life as a, as a definition of stewardship. Um, I told her how I was kind of struggling with that definition along work. And she said, you know, Enid, I just stopped at Arby's and the clerk was kind to me. She was doing her job and I left feeling better than I came. And she was just you know, taking money for fast food. And that she was stewarding the people that came to her. And I think that was pretty wise. Yes? So I've been thinking about this a lot over the last couple of years. And I've come to is that we all decide what we're going to do with our life based on completely inaccurate Like, you know, Pastor Jason would talk about this. You know, you don't know what it's going to be like to be a pastor to the Milwaukee Church. You don't know what it's going to be like to be a teacher. You don't know what it's going to be like to be a whatever job it is. And therefore, the chance that you're, you're going to end up in the perfect place for you is actually pretty specific. Right. But the solution, and, and sort of once you realize that, that's actually pretty liberating. You know, like, that weight is kind of up. And the challenge then becomes where, where you end up is how do you find meaning, how do you find connection? You know, what you do makes Cindy happy. Yeah. Because of your connection with so many Yeah. Um, and so, um, and, and maybe you, you really truly don't end up in a good place and you need to move on. But the first question to ask yourself is, I think, and this is something I talk to my children about and young people about, and people I've taught, is like, before you decide to move on, or before you decide this isn't the right place for you, ask yourself, 
in what way can I contribute here? In what way can I find meaning in what's the other? Yeah. So it's finding the meaning where you are. I, I think one of the things in choosing a career, we're asking our high school juniors, what are you going to be when you grow up? This is ridiculous. I've had three jobs that I didn't know existed when I was a high school senior, and they may not have. My first job teaching English as a second language, I was among the first to be doing that on a professional level. They didn't have it. You couldn't study at school. They hired foreign language teachers, and we had teaching jobs then. I think asking what you want to be when you grow up is the question. Amen. I think the question is who do you want to be? Right. Asking what you want to be is the wrong question. You should be saying who do you want to be? And where do you want to be? What do you want out of life? Um, th this might seem ridiculous, but it was profound to my husband. There's an episode of the Andy Griffith show where Opie is leaving the sheriff's office to run off to school and Andy buttons his shirt or something and sends him off and he said be someone instead of being a good boy or doing you know study hard or listen to your teacher be someone and that I think is the thing that we hope we impart on our children and, and, and the hope that we live to ourselves to be someone More on work? Just the thought that it, it seems to me, too, in addition to doing what you do with kindness, like the person that passed you, in this day and age, whatever you do, doing it with integrity yeah. is, I think, becoming more and more important. Yes. So, stewarding your every action. The act within kindness. And honesty and and accuracy we'll go on to our history okay right is it is it a luxury to have this conversation yes it is a luxury to have this conversation I think you're right yeah, um, but I hope also, if you're working for survival, that you're still in a place to say, am I doing my best? Am I demonstrating to my children that I, that I value hard work? video is the Studs Terkel, Studs Terkel, Terkel, Terkel book, Working. Was that 70s? Maybe in the 1970s? Would that perspective be different today? When I graduated from college in 1977, there were no jobs. Um, it wasn't like, well, if you studied hard, you're going to go out and you're going to get a job. And, and you knew it was going to be a starter job, but you were going to get into a company and make it. You took any job you could. If you were a teacher, you went to Borup, Minnesota, if there was an opening there. If you were in some ridiculous area, such as a Scandinavian studies and German major, <laughs> you took whatever job you could get. For me, it ended up being as a TA in grad school, the only way I could get a job was to go out to school. But uh, that didn't mean we didn't work. We've, well, well, many people couldn't, but, but you found whatever you could do, and you made something of it. And by doing that, I found careers that I never knew existed, that, and I found work that was meaningful, and because you weave your way through. Sub Circle had a radio show in Chicago, and he'd end every uh, show with the phrase, take it easy, but take it. 
There you go. Take it easy, but take it. Actually, instead of talking about history, reputation, digital footprint, and everything else, I'm going to stop here because we're five minutes away from the next service. But come back next week. I'll be here. I won't be here all week, but I'll be here next week. So thanks a lot for coming. <laughs>